This is Dean Blandino, Senior Vice President of Officiating for the National Football League. And this is the media and network video for Friday, September 2nd, 2016. We'll start with player safety. Our first rule change involved chop blocks. Now all two-man high-low blocks are illegal. And that would include in the run game, the pass game, and the kicking game. And so you're going to watch the block here. It's going to be the center and the left guard and you'll see the center is going to go low and the guard is going to make contact above the waist so that's a two-man high-low block that is a foul that was legal last year because they were adjacent players on the line and it occurred during a running play this year this will be a foul and that was called during the preseason all chop blocks all two-man high-low blocks whether they occur in the run game the passing game or the kicking game they are all illegal and it doesn't matter where the players started in terms of alignment at the snap. Another rule in terms of low blocks that we wanted to make sure everybody understood the rule. And it's going to be this player here, 83. He, we had a double tight end to the left here. And the second tight end is, is considered flexed. And what that means is, is that means he is two or more yards outside the normal tackle position. So, And basically, you can see the right tackle there. That second tight end is flexed. And this tight end here is not flexed. And what does that mean? Okay, that means that a player that is flexed, he cannot come back and block a defender below the waist toward the original position of where the ball was snapped from. This is an illegal crackback block. It doesn't matter if the block occurs from the front from the side, from behind, you cannot block low going back toward the original position of the football if you are flexed two or more yards outside the tackle. So here, the second tight end is going to block low back toward the original position of the football. That is a foul for an illegal crack back block. The rule applies five yards on either side of the line of scrimmage. So the tight end could block back toward the, the position of the football, but the flexed player two or more yards outside the tackle cannot. We talk about blindside blocks and protections for the punter. And so we're going to follow the punter here. And, and the punter is going to get defenseless player protection throughout a kicking down. So that means that you cannot block the punter in the head neck area or use the crown to make a block to any part of his body at any point during the down, regardless of his posture, whether he's pursuing the play or not. Now here, the punter is clearly pursuing the play, so you cannot block him in the head neck area. The other rule here that would apply would be a blindside block because the blocker is moving toward his own goal line. And you're going to see the block is actually going to be to the chest with the shoulder, so that makes this a legal block. This is a legal block. You can commit this block legally by making contact with the shoulder to the body, even if it's the punter, even if you're moving toward your own goal line. So an example of a legal block on the punter. Another example of a legal block, blocker is going to be moving toward his own goal line. So in this situation, we know that the blocker cannot go to the head neck area. That player, 57 on defense, is a de in, the, in a defenseless posture as it relates to the block that he cannot see coming. So that player, the blocker, the onus is on him to make contact below the head neck area. And you can see the blocker here do a great job getting his head across the front and making contact with the shoulder to the body. This is a legal block. If that were to the head neck area, it would be a foul. Point of emphasis this year is clearing the field when there are player injuries. So this is what it should look like. We should have no players, substitutes, assistant coaches on the field when the player is being attended to. The medical staff needs to have the ability to move freely and to tend to that player. The head coach can be out to check on an injured player. That's it from the coaching staff. No other coach can be out there during an injury timeout, and we are going to keep this area clear so the medical staff can freely move and treat that player. The other point of emphasis is coaches in the field of play. Coaches cannot be in the field of play at any point during the game, and those rules apply during timeouts as well. Those rules will be strictly enforced. Coaches are not allowed in the field of play. The exception, which you see here, is the head coach checking on an injured player. A team will get a warning first, and then after a warning, it will be a 15-yard penalty for unsportsmanlike conduct. And so, again, we need to keep the field clear. That is the direction from the competition committee, and that is what we will do in officiating, strictly enforce these rules, and keep the coaches off the field. 
interesting play here involving the rule with a receiver going out of bounds and potentially being the first to touch the pass. So you'll see the receiver here down here at the bottom. And he's going to be legally forced out of bounds. So he's going to step in the white. So now if he's legally forced out of bounds or he goes out of bounds on his own, he cannot reestablish inbounds with both feet and be the first to touch the pass. That is a foul for illegal touch. The exception, though, is if the ball is first touched by an eligible player. And this is an interesting play. The receiver is going to go out of bounds, but the pass is going to be tipped by a different receiver. So if an eligible player touches it first, that's an eligible receiver on offense or any defensive player touches the football first, then that receiver who went out of bounds can reestablish and catch the football, which is what happened here. You see the official with his hat off. That signifies that he has the receiver stepping out of bounds. That's the side judge. The head linesman is going to observe that the pass was tipped. They get together and talk about it, and this ends up being a legal play because the eligible player touched the ball inbounds first, and then the player reestablished and caught it. Whether that was a defensive player or an eligible receiver, that would make this receiver eligible to catch the pass. And this is a legal play and a touchdown. Catch, no catch. This is something that we'll continue to show examples of. And again, the rule is control, then two feet, then time. The time element is defined as having the ball long enough to clearly become a runner. We've added language to the rule book to explain what that means. That means after two feet are down, did he turn up field? Did he tuck the ball away? Did he take additional steps? Does he have the ability to avoid or take on contact? So here's a good example at full speed of a receiver completing a catch. He's going to control it, take two steps, turn up field, tuck the ball away, and take on contact. That is a catch, and in this instance, a fumble. Officials are ruling these at full speed on the field. When they go to replay, we are watching them at full speed to get the true sense of the time element, and then we will slow it down to look at things like control and feet. But we were always looking at it at full speed for the time element. And if this is a bang-bang play, and he doesn't turn up field or tuck the ball away, or take additional steps after the second step is down and the ball comes out, it's an incomplete pass. Lastly, kickoffs. We've changed the rule for the touchback to the 25 this year. Wanted to explain the kickoff out of bounds rule. Here's a short kick. The ball is going to get touched by several players and then end up being recovered in bounds by the return team. Let's say the kick went out of bounds untouched. That's a kickoff out of bounds. So if it goes out of bounds untouched, that's a kickoff out of bounds, and the return team will get the ball at their 40-yard line. If the ball is last touched by the kicking team, so it doesn't matter who touches it first or how many times it's touched, but if the kicking team is the last team to touch it and then it goes out of bounds, that is a kickoff out of bounds, and the receiving team will get the ball to 40-yard line. If the return team is the last to touch, then the ball will be out of bounds at that spot, and that's where the return team will get it. So if they touch it last and then it goes out of bounds, the return team touches it last, then it will be their ball at the out-of-bounds spot. Just some numbers on kickoffs. And again, preseason kick return numbers do not translate to regular season. Coaches are evaluating players. They want to see their kick return team. They want to see their cover team. You will see more kick returns than in the preseason than you will during the regular season. That said, just a snapshot of the first three weeks of the preseason. In 2016, we've returned 60% of our kicks compared to 58% in 2015 and 62% in 2014. So the numbers are more or less the same. So we haven't seen an increase in kick returns, at least in the preseason. Now, more kicks are being kicked in the field of play. More balls are being returned from the field of play. But again, we have to wait and see what happens during the regular season, and we can't Look at just one week. Typically, we look at four weeks as a significant enough sample size to make an opinion as to how a rule change is working. So let's see what happens after four weeks. But the rule change going into the season, touchbacks at the 25. That's the video. Appreciate the attention. And certainly let us know if there are any questions.